I'd like to begin tonight by thanking our co-presenting partner, the Conte Center at Harvard, of which one of our speakers tonight is the director. We also have a debt of gratitude to the Lowell Institute, whose contributions have made this program possible. Philosophers and writers from Confucius to Shakespeare to Maya Angelou to even Bob Marley <laughs> have expounded on the virtues and necessity of music to the human condition. According to Plato, quote, music is a moral law. Bless you. It gives soul to the universe, wings to the mind, flight to the imagination, and charm and gaiety to life. It is this sentiment we examine and celebrate tonight. We will watch as minds are given wings to travel back in time, imaginations soar, and lives dulled by time and circumstance ignite with passion and excitement. Current research across the globe on the physiological and psychological effects of music suggests that music can reduce chronic pain, lower heart rate, boost immune system response, and improve mood. Each of our special guests tonight is renowned for his research studies on the brain. They will give us an update on what they are discovering and enlighten us about the realities and the potential of music as a treatment for healing. First, we will hear from Takao Hench, next from Gottfried Schlaug, and then we will watch Alive Inside. Finally, following the film, they'll take questions from the audience. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Takao Hench. Well, thanks, Tricia, Lisa, and the Museum of Science for having us here. Um, we are uh, partners in this uh, adventure to try and link brain science to a variety of uh, interesting aspects of our daily lives. And today, the theme is music and the brain. And we're gathered here around a truly remarkable film, which you're about to see, uh, which highlights many aspects of music and what makes it fascinating, um, not only from the brain science perspective, but ourselves as human beings. And um, you'll hear a lot from Dr. Schlaug about how music engages the brain, so I don't want to take a lot of his time. But one aspect of this film which is quite striking is how music can tap into the inner selves of these um, patients and people who are seemingly uh, locked away. And these aspects of music are uh, very interesting because they tap into their heyday, a time when they were up and about and really uh, vibrant members of society. And this is something that we study, not music per se, but how our brains are shaped by experience early in life. And just like any function, whether it's vision, hearing, smell, our brain is shaped very much early in life during uh, critical periods or sensitive periods when our first experiences are particularly potent. So if I were to ask you what's on your music player, and you're older than 30, let's say, I bet most of those songs harken back to your adolescence or are from a genre of the time when you are um, very, very much sensitive to developing preferences. And there are many such examples of preference behaviors forming. This is a particularly fun study published, uh, published in the New York Times last year um, where Bill Marsh uh, went to Facebook and um, made this interesting observation that if you're a baseball fan, Chances are you became a fan, especially if you were a boy, um, between the ages of 8 and 12, and especially so if your team won the World Series. And so there's lots of anecdote, and I'm sure you can think of many such examples where um, something that happened at a particular time early in life was particularly potent. And this is because our brains are shaped through a two-step process. There are genes that lay out the neural circuitry which allow us to process information in the first place. And we're roughly born with similar looking brains with the right parts operating on the right function. So the back of the brain processing vision, uh, the sides of the brain hearing and the front emotion and cognition, for example. Barring any uh, severe mutations, those things are set in place through a highly uh, orchestrated program of events. But then something truly remarkable happens 
We are born and we experience the world. Our environment has a chance to shape our identities, shape these circuits in a way that makes our, our outlook on life different, one from the next. The languages we speak, the emotions we carry in response to the very same stimulus. And these critical periods occur in waves. So there are earlier waves which are uh, inducing plasticity in those primary sensory areas, the ability to hear your native speech sound versus non-native speech sounds and so on. And then we develop motor skills and higher order language abilities. And then eventually what we call higher cognitive skills, which we may remain plastic for quite some time in the case of humans. And so what about music? Can we test whether there's a critical period for music? Or there are many such studies that um, uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Schlau will also get into. But we study this at a very basic cellular molecular level. And so in order to do that, we need an animal model. We'd like to be able to look into the animal's brain eventually and see what kinds of changes happen. So what happens if you expose mouse to music? Would you expect them to have any kind of preference behavior or any kind of um, response to this admittedly human activity? Well, we can test this. What you're looking at here are four individual mice across the top who are um, running around in an open field, as we call it. And in two corners are small huts or uh, little nesting areas where they can relax and, and build a nest. And what you see in a typical mouse is that they explore wildly their environment. And uh, you can see that they like to stay around the sides of the, the open field. So the red indicates where the mouse has been and uh, rarely cross the center. But if you wait and let the animal finish exploring after a few hours, they settle down. And so you'll see the mouse on the left has um, pretty much uh, established a preference for the hut in the lower left corner. The, one, the second one is still actively exploring. The third one maybe fell asleep in the upper right corner. And the fourth one, uh, likewise, in the upper left corner. So you see that um, they can indicate uh, where they feel comfortable. And what was amazing to us was that if we raise mice listening to music, their behavior will shift from their innate preference. So in this experiment, um, the two huts are playing either no music or some music that they either heard before or not heard before in life. And what an, a wild type mouse would do normally is to avoid novelty. And so they would end up nesting in the silent chamber. But interestingly, and that's indicated here, so this is a three-part graph, a naive mouse, uh, maybe 75% of them will choose silence over a music chamber. But if the mouse had been raised listening to music in this critical time, uh, early postnatal days, then as adults, months later, tested in this way, they would prefer the chamber playing the music they grew up with over their innate bias for silence. If you uh, take a similar amount of time and put an adult mouse in a music exposure situation, it doesn't change their innate preference for silence. And so there's something about this developmental window where music has a particularly potent impact on the animal's adult preference behavior. And what was interesting is that this also impacts their anxiety you can measure the amount of time they spend willingly crossing the center of this open field, an area that is potentially exposed to predators and something that they don't like to do, as I mentioned. And curiously, mice who develop a preference for music will be more willing to cross or less anxious, we interpret this as, mice who don't develop a music preference. And so where in the brain would this be mediated? Well. We know that there is an emotion network in the brain. It involves structures like the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. And these areas of the brain are activated by complex stimuli, which are often difficult to uh, pinpoint. In this case, in the upper panels, you're looking at the prefrontal cortex of these mice, mice who acqu acquired a preference for music and those who didn't. And what you see is that these cells light up in response to the music they grew up with or the acoustic uh, signatures that they grew up with, as opposed to those who didn't get this exposure. This panel here is um, non-exposed, uh, not stimulating the animal, doesn't activate this part of the brain at all. The prefrontal cortex in people is also very uh, fascinating and involves um, 
regions of the brain that are involved in social behaviors, for example, or kinship or familiarity. And this is a, a picture I borrowed from a study by Randy Buckner's lab at Harvard, where he identified in humans that the medial prefrontal cortex might respond to um, images of people who are familiar to you or who might have shared interests like similar religious beliefs or political uh, inclinations and so on. And so this part of the brain is rather mysterious but uh, undergoes an interesting development. And early in life, um, it's not yet online. And it's probably one of the last parts of the brain that undergoes this critical period. And that's why, uh, perhaps, that music in your adolescence is particularly potent in sculpting your preference behaviors. As you can see from these cartoons, initially our emotional behaviors are heavily driven by the amygdala and communicating up to a prefrontal cortex which comes online in these adolescent years. And then eventually, as adults, the prefrontal cortex has a strong inhibitory or modulatory role on this baseline fear or emotion uh, processing center called the amygdala. And so the development of these circuits is very sensitive to music. And I'd like you to keep that in mind as we uh, watch the film, how perhaps the choice of music was particularly uh, pivotal in the results that are being reported. Critical periods are not only about uh, developing preferences. I just want to mention that it's most striking and most clear when you think about mental illness and developmental disorders. Most mental illnesses arise during uh, childhood and adolescence. And uh, you can think of many, uh, schizophrenia, autism, mood disorders, anxiety disorders. And this is really where our research in the lab is trying to make an impact. Can we understand why these windows of opportunity are also windows of vulnerability? And earlier in this series, you've heard about um, depression and anxiety from a, a human clinical perspective. And what we're trying to do is to understand at the neurobiological level how these windows come about, what determines their timing, and what might close them because if we could eventually understand this at a very deep biological level, we might one day be able to reverse engineer it perhaps or reopen such a window if necessary in a therapeutic setting. I'd just like to finish by saying that uh, we are celebrating in May Mental Health Awareness and one of our partners in the, the Conti Center Outreach Endeavors is the National Alliance on Mental Illness and they sponsor a walk um, to raise awareness and reduce stigma around mental illnesses. This is happening on Saturday, May 16th. The weather has finally improved. The Red Sox are winning, sort of. And um, it's a good time to get out there. It's a short walk. I think you can enjoy it and um, really uh, do some service to help uh, raise awareness about mental illness. So I hope you'll consider that. So I will turn over this time now to Dr. Schlaug, who will tell you much more about music and how it affects the brain. Thank you so much, uh, Takao, and thank you, Tricia, and Lisa, and the Science for um, inviting us here and giving us this opportunity to present. Um, I'm wondering if this is coming on by itself or? Oh, no, it's All right, there we are. So um, I will talk um, a little bit about our own research, but I will try to make references to the movie that you will see, point out some of the things that I think you would want to pay attention to that you want to think about, and then hopefully you will develop the questions uh, later that we can then address um, with regard to this. When I talk about our own research, I will so like talk about maybe two or three interventions that we do with patients that are not too dissimilar to what you might be seeing in a movie, um, but um, we're probably going into a little bit more depth to understand um, what actually happens in the brain and how we can measure um, outcome. So when I think of music and music making, I think of this that this is not just an auditory experience, but that 
music is much, much more, that it is a multi-sensory, that it is a motor experience, it makes us move, it creates emotions, it taps into our emotional system, as Sakao already pointed out, it activates pleasure and reward system, and it's a very rich stimulus that we have at our disposal um, to use. We do know, and I'll show you a few examples of this, that if we are making music for a long period of time, it actually has the potential to change the brain, not just the structure of the brain, but also the function of the brain. And therefore, the question has come up for many years actually now, whether or not music making um, has sort of like these extra musical benefit that can potentially be used to heal, to regenerate, and to repair the mind and the brain. Imaging has allowed us to actually peek inside the skull, to look at the brain, to look at the brain anatomy, to look at the brain function, and to understand the components of the central nervous system and how function actually arises. Uh, and we also know how the components of this nervous system can potentially be um, adapted or can adapt themselves or can regenerate in order to either deal with injury or to deal, for example, with aging effects. Um, and all of this, there's lots of research to actually show that, that this has happened and can happen if we so like know what to do and how which triggers to actually use. When we looked at musicians or when we started out looking at differences between musicians and non-musicians, one of the first structures that we were interested in is called the corpus callosum, which is sort of like this main fiber tract here in the middle that connects the right and the left side of the brain. It is interesting from a neurobiological perspective because it's one of the later maturing parts in the brain. And for a musician, it has a great um, importance because it is probably critically involved in coordinating bimanual movements. So we were interested to see whether or not musicians have a larger size of this particular structure, and indeed they do. If you look at these two musicians here and compare this with this one here, there was, there's a big difference actually in the size of this midline structure. And we found in this cross-sectional study that early beginning musicians, those ones who started relatively early when we think the brain, the brain is most plastic, um, and those ones who practiced the most had the, the biggest difference in the size of this structure. And sometimes we were sort of like surprised to find some of the differences. For example, here uh, in the red circle is a part of the motor cortex that controls um, hand and finger movements. And we were particularly interested to find actually differences of adaptation depending on what kind of instrument you play. And when you, when you look at the structure, uh, for example, here you look at a string player of the part of the brain, this is the left side of the brain controlling the right hand. So the string player usually doesn't have as much fine finger movements to practice with the right hand. So this particular structure here actually doesn't look much different um, when we would compare that to a non-musician where I don't show you here. But when you look at the other side of the brain, here the right side of the brain which controls the left hand, or when you look at a keyboard players on both sides of the brain, you see that the structure has become much more complex. And what is astounding here is actually that it has become so complex that we can actually, when we know where to look and how to look, that we can detect this with um, our eyes. Um, a few years ago, actually, somebody um, found um, the brain of a very well-known person um, and measured this particular structure in this particular person um, who was known at the time to be an excellent violin player and indeed um, so like found a similarly exaggerated structure or part of the presental gyrus. Um, so obviously there have been numerous regions now in the brain where we have found differences between musicians and non-musicians and where we have found that there are training effects that account for these differences. We've also over the years run 
um, longitudinal studies in children and have actually shown that um, these effects that we have seen in adults in a cross-sectional comparison that we can actually um, see these effects evolving over time in children that are naive to musical instruments but actually pick up a musical instrument and practice so that we actually now know that some of these structural differences are really due to training. I don't want to necessarily go into great detail. Um, in the next slide, I wanted to point out to you that the, this phenomenon that we have found that music becomes, um, the older we get in life, a multi-sensory experiment, and multi-sensory experience. And this is like shown in this slide here, where we have done a functional imaging experiment. The task was that they had to compare two rhythmic sequences, but we have also two melodic sequences. And in young children, you see that are relatively musically naive, you see that it mainly activates auditory regions of the brain. So they experience it really as a sound, not necessarily as a sequence of sounds, but just as an overall sound. And they're making an overall decision whether or not that's different or not different. The older we get, even with no active musical experience, you will actually see that there are other regions in the brain come into play. And these other regions actually become much more prominent when we acquire musical training. And when we look at, for example, this picture here of adults, we see that it's really these other regions in the, what we call the parietal lobe of the brain, the frontal lobe of the brain, that become active even though the task has, and the, the, the uh, stimulus hasn't actually changed, but the way that we are approaching this, that we, the way that we are trying to solve this task is really different because we are operating with more experience. We have heard or seen or have some memories of that sound um, that activates these different regions of the brain. And in particular, what is important to us, and I will point this out in, in some subsequent slides, are uh, these regions in the frontal part of the brain that have that are critically involved in mapping sounds to any kind of actions that we want to do and that are also critically involved in sequencing sounds and in predicting the sequence of sounds. All of these regions that connect the temporal lobe, the parietal lobe and the frontal lobe are actually connected via a structure which is called the arcuate fasciculus, which is a basically a white matter superhighway that, um, that, that has connections with all of these regions and that um, helps information transfer between those two. Most interestingly, when we looked at this particular structure, it really sort of connects these hearing regions in the brain with the sound motor mapping regions in the brain and the feedback of these regions we found that in singers who constantly have to practice this, this particular structure actually is significantly enlarged, which is like another example potentially of how the brain might adapt to these uh, requirements that um, some people put themselves under. And most interestingly, in people who can't sing, or people who are out of tune singers, um, they actually have a problem in their brain. Usually, it's actually, my, my estimate is that it is the most abundant uh, developmental disorder that there is. <laughs> so I usually find at least one in five people who have this kind of a problem. Does anybody here can't sing in tune? <laughs> I'm pretty sure there are more. So from a neurobiological perspective, it is, it is a really interesting phenomenon because it does tell us something about how the hearing region in the brain interacts with the motor region and how those two actually try to come up with solutions if somebody is uh, challenged. Now, I told you about the frontal part of the brain and how that is important to actually map sounds to action. And I wanted to expose you to this experiment that we did here, where we asked people to, that had never been exposed to a musical instrument to play a five-tone sequence or a mellow, short melody. And other people, we just passively exposed this. So some people learn to play this on a keyboard. They learned the connection between key strikes and sounds. And other people didn't, but they still were passively exposed. 
The most important comparison is when we had them listen in an MRI scanner to the melodies that they had learned to map to motor action versus melodies that were just passively exposed. And when we sort of like subtract these two conditions, the region that really sort of like stood out as being different is this region here in the front part of the brain. When we see this on the left side of the brain, this is actually what's, what's traditionally referred to as Broca's region. So most of us always think as Broca's region as a region in the brain that has something to do with the expressive part of language and is very important in speech fluency. Um, on the right side, we call it a Broca homologue because we don't really know what it does. But it may actually be a much more general function that this region has, that it is really critically involved in mapping sounds to action. And that can be potentially any kind of action. That can be articulatory action, but it can be hand action. And it has actually been shown that there is hand representation in this particular region of the brain. And I'd like to point out this study because you will see in some of the subsequent slides that we use a lot of hand activity in order to engage our speech apparatus. So if music making engages and changes the brain, can it be used as a therapeutic tool to improve neurological impairments and disorders? And there are numerous examples. Some of them are somewhat speculative. Others are at the level of where it has been shown that there is at least um, some proof in, in uncontrolled studies. And the third group is so like at the verge of actually being tested in what we call randomized controlled trials, which is so like the highest level of actually proving that a drug or an intervention has any kind of efficacy. And that will be one of the points that I will try to make when you look at the movie as, um, uh, after my talk, which is that we have to get, if we want to prove that music has, music listening, music making has efficacy, we almost have to treat music as a drug, as, an, as a device that, um, that has to be subjected to the same kind of rigors of clinical, clinical testing that we would do with any kind of other drug. And in that sense, we have to actually do randomized controlled trials to show the efficacy of our interventions. So I will show you a few examples of how singing might help patients with um, speech impairments after a stroke, such as a non-fluent aphasia. Um, we have seen these kinds of patients um, for more than 100 years, people who have suffered a stroke, and you can see actually the stroke here marked in red, that impairs their speech motor region, and they typically have very poor spontaneous speech, so they can't describe um, a particular action, a particular procedure, something that they like to do. So their spontaneous speech is particularly impaired. Sometimes they can name single items where they can say some syllables. Sometimes they get stuck on particular syllables and can't get the entire word out. And this is sort of like this movie here where I'm going to ask this patient to say the words of happy birthday. And you will see that he has really trouble actually saying this and he's sort of like perseverating on some syllables and just can't get it out. And at the end I'm asking him to sing it and uh, hopefully you will hear the clear difference there. Happy birthday to you. Can you say that again? Say that again. Yes. Okay. Can you sing it now? Yes. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, little Lee. Happy birthday to you. O and O. And O. So his perseveration is that he says O and O and O and he just can't get out the words of happy birthday. And one of the reasons is that this particular structure here, which is the arcuate fasciculus on the left side of the brain, which is very elaborate, which is another form of adaptation that we go through as we develop um, from, from young children to adults, 
that this particular structure on the left is completely destroyed uh, due to his stroke. So even if he wanted to speak, um, and if he wanted to do this through the left side of the brain, he couldn't. But he can actually sing. And the question is, can we, can we use this singing to help him learn how to speak again? And one of the reasons that he can sing, because this structure here, this, this redundant structure actually on the right side of his brain, which doesn't quite look as pretty as the one on the left side, but this structure on the right side of the brain does the basic task. Um, it allows him, if there is some intonation to it, if there's some melody to it, it allows him actually to put words on this um, scaffold to, to have some form of expression. And our task is actually now to see whether or not we can utilize this to make somebody really speak or at least like make them better at um, what this patient was able to do when we described, when we asked him to say the words of happy birthday. So we take them through a very rigorous uh, training program and we look, we do functional imaging studies before and after and we do structural studies before and after. The main findings here are that when we compare before treatment to after treatment of word repetitions that they have to do in the scanner, we actually can see that on the right side of the brain there's more activity and we particularly engage these regions of the brain which we call the proca homologues or like the, the speech motor regions in the brain. And the most surprising to us was actually when we look at, at the connection between the hearing region and the speech motor region of the brain, this connection actually changed as well over time. These patients get at least 110 hours or so of um, intense therapy from us over many weeks and we certainly encourage them to practice at home as well. So it's not inconceivable that structure even in a 70 year old individual uh, could change. Um, although we were very surprised actually to see this and we sort of continue to understand um, how the structure could actually change, what made it change and whether or not it is really functional for our patients. Um, I think I'm going to skip a little bit. Um, what I wanted to point out here is that although we have shown the effects um, of what we call melodic intonation therapy in this study, we still need to prove that it's actually not just the melodic intonation therapy or not just any kind of therapy that would be done in an intense way, but we actually need to prove if we want to establish that singing does the job, we have to compare singing to something else. And that's actually done in this randomized controlled trial where we compare melodic intonation therapy to a therapy that we made up that is similar, but it doesn't actually have the intonation component. We call this therapy speech repetition therapy. And if this trial here is successful, and if we can show at the end of this trial that melodic intonation therapy was better or had a better outcome than speech repetition therapy, then we can actually make the claim that melodic intonation therapy has something really unique to it, that it does do something that other therapies can't do. And that would be the same level, same proof that one would require if I would just give a new drug to this patient to try and show that this drug so like, has that kind of an effect. I would still have to compare it to some other established drug. I want to show you maybe just a few slides on another intervention that we are trying, which is very similar. Um, and this is a form of singing um, in children that um, have autism, but it have a particular form of autism, which is called nonverbal autism. Um, we know that the incidence of autism is increasing and about 30% of kids um, that have autism are actually in this non-verbal, minimally verbal category. There's hardly any research done because they are the most challenging kids that are out there and there's hardly any therapeutic application that's actually tested. Now from our perspective, what is good is that these children love and enjoy musical activities and therefore we used our experiences with adult stroke patients and aphasic patients and said, well, a form of singing that we can somehow combine with hand motor activity seems to work in these patients. 
that might potentially work in kids that can speak as well. So we developed an intervention that consists of using toon drums, lots of finger activities, and lots of vocal motor activities that we combine with hand motor activities um, to engage their articulatory, their expressive functions in the brain. Um, one of our first subjects, um, we, we had, we, we tried and we optimized the technique and we almost were ready to give up because it was just so difficult. It was so difficult to get the kids to do anything. And then we found one child who basically didn't do a lot in the beginning. And here's like how the intervention works. Okay, wait a to watch. Yeah. Hello. You should just sit in the chair, just sit in the chair. Maybe I can cut directly to the other movie. So we didn't really get much out of the first session and really not much out of the next uh, 11. And we were really ready to give up. And then this happened in the 12th session. It's time for... So you can imagine what the parents went through who actually really hadn't heard actually his voice uh, besides some squeaky sounds then all of a sudden actually hear him making sounds that are appropriate that sound like words um, and over time he actually developed into being able to say a few words in a string and a lot of this was appropriate obviously he was one of our stars not all the kids are like this but in most of the kids that we have done, we have gotten them to say um, some sounds that are appropriate. And of course, our intervention is not a lifelong intervention. We have particularly restricted it to a period of time where we know we can potentially get a response that we can measure so that we can actually see and quantitatively determine whether or, whether or not our intervention works. So here is uh, another child and we teaching this child to say the phrase more please which is a very common sign language phrase that these kids learn oops sorry what's that mean what's this mm -hmm. yeah watch more please now you sing it that's who you have to use your mouth and make a sound. More. You do it. Please. So that was one of the first sessions. And then here, after about 15 to 20 sessions. More. Good. One more time. We ask for. More. It doesn't sound pretty yet, but um, it, he will certainly get there. Um, they have on top of this, when they actually start speaking in the beginning, they have a form of what's called speech apraxia. So they really have to learn to use their, their fine muscles to make the appropriate sounds. Um, I think I'm going to skip the Parkinson's um, um, figures and just to conclude, that uh, listening and making music is a multi-sensory motor experience. It makes us move, it creates movements, it creates emotions, gives us pleasure and reward. Um, if we make music over a long period of time, we have the ability to change the brain, not just the function, but the structure as well. And incorporating music making activities into rehabilitation does not only give the therapist a powerful tool, but it makes use of the intrinsic brain connections that there exist between the auditory and the motor system. And on top of this, it combines this tool or this intervention with the pleasure and the reward system. That really makes music a, a very powerful um, intervention. So there have been lots of people that have contributed to this that I wanted to give um, credit to and, and uh, the people who have supported this um, over the years um, with their contributions and their money. Thank you very much.
What do you think of music? My heart belongs to music. I, I love it. Have you ever had music just hit you in a place that immediately brought you to tears? Music has that power. Music connects people with who they have been, who they are, and their lives. Because what happens when you get old is all the things you're familiar with and your identity are all just being peeled away. The healthcare system imagines the human to be a very complicated machine. We have medicines that can adjust the dials. Blood pressure, oh, turn that down. Blood sugar, oh, turn that down. We haven't done anything to touch the heart and soul of a patient. I'm a man on fire, walking through your street. Music has more ability to activate more parts of the brain than any other stimulus. It's left in me. Hold on, hold on. Who am I? Huh? Who am I? I'm your daughter. By exciting or awakening those pathways, we have a gateway to stimulate and reach somebody who otherwise is unreachable. Come dance with me. Takes me back to my school days. Oh, God, that's, that's beautiful. you happy to sing for us? Yeah. I'm crying. Every human being needs stimulation from the outside, from little babies to old people. American culture is wrong. There is actually life beyond adulthood. There's the opportunity to live and grow and become elders. The aging that we experience holds in it very important learnings and lessons. There is no pill that does that. So there's a, a tears of joy. Yeah. I thought you were going to grow wings. I was trying. <laughs> <laughs>
you know, our the, the more multi-sensory we can make our experiences, probably the better it is, the more we are able to encode these experiences, the more we are able to develop memory traces of these experiences. Um, and there are probably other activities. I mean, I'm, I'm saying this as a music researcher. I, I have a hard time believing that I'm actually saying it, but there may be other activities out there <laughs> um, that, that would have the same kind of multi-sensory experiences. Um, and I think that is, you know, obviously the movie was extremely powerful, and I'm pretty sure it all touched us in various ways. Um, but, you know, we also heard the struggle on how how can we make this into something, let's say, that the insurance companies would pay for? How can we make this into something that the nursing homes can put into their budgets? So one way to actually do this is to really show that it is effective. And I alluded to this in, the, in, in my talk, to show that, that music listening, music making activities are effective, we have to find something that we can control it to some other intervention that may be multi-sensory as well. And some of that research is sort of like bubbling up. Uh, you know, people are thinking about this, and there are some studies out there already, but as you can see, it would be very difficult to find something that is comparable to this, that is as powerful, but lacks the essential ingredients. And we don't quite know yet what are the essential ingredients in this, you know. Is it music that is familiar? You know, is it music that evokes emotion? Is it music that connects us with our past experiences? So we have to think about these things uh, when we come up with the most optimal control intervention. That would be similar, but not the same. So then hopefully prove that it's this type of intervention that sort of like has all the beneficial effects. Maybe Next I could question. just add the multi-sensory question and uh, studying early deaf or early blind subjects is uh, some of the more interesting evidence for critical periods in humans and the degree to which this cross-modal uh, activation um, can be seen is correlated with how early these uh, deficiencies happen. And so the ability to use visual cortex to read braille and touch or to localize the sound source in space is um, inversely related with how early these defects or uh, unfortunate circumstances arose. So it's uh, um, a testament to the early plasticity that the brain can show. Next question here. Thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful movie and the work done by uh, Dr. Bill Thomas. Now you have sh shown two spectrums, one with the cognitive degenerative memory problems and how the music works. And the other side, the psychiatric manic depressive, both kind of, there's a lot of difference between these two, but uh, initially you said about memory and music role evoking those potentials. How does this work in the psychiatric patients? Um, I wish I had answers to all of these questions. Um, I mean, we, what we know so far is that, that music certainly has this ability to evoke memories, to tap into our emotions, to create emotional feelings, and to connect us to the past. We also know that particular characteristics of music have an effect on our psyche, on our mind, um, and on our bodily responses. So for example, we, we know that music that has a particular beat that is in relationship to our heartbeat can actually calm us down. So there is some research that has shown that we can, we can use music, we can use music that, that has a relatively slow beat to, to decrease anxiety, to uh, make us more calm. In the same way, we can use music that has a particular fast beat, and that's loud, to arouse us. 
to make us excited, to agitate us. Um, and you know, if you look at balance aspects of music, we, we, there's music out there that has been shown to create a good feeling. There's music that's out there that we know that creates a sad feeling for us. And the paradox sometimes is that if I'm sad, I actually may want to listen to sad music. I just want to hear something that sort of like matches this to pick me up where I am. Um, but this type of research is already there. And you can potentially you know, apply that to various types of psychiatric disorders. Um, certainly might work in anxiety disorders, might work in depression. It's a little bit more tricky when it gets to relatively complex disorders such as schizophrenia or, or manic depressive disorders. Um, but you know, in, in some ways, um, an indifference to drugs, music al would allow us to package this every time we want, every day we want. We can package music in a different way. And that's actually when you take your aspirin, you can't do that. Okay? You have to take your 81 milligrams every day. They don't come up with a new way of taking this or packaging that. I guess I could add uh, in my little introduction, I mentioned that uh, music that you grow up with uh, seems to promote the development of particular circuits in the brain that are related to emotion regulation, anxiety, and so on. And so at least in the film, you've seen that a very potent form of music was uh, something that they were familiar with, tailored to the history of the individual. Um, and it could very well be that even in the lowly mouse, we're able to see the, the first hints of why this might work. It might be a way to tap into these very fundamental circuits that relieve anxiety first. And you see immediately in the eyes of these individuals, when the music goes on, they relax. You see something that um, is tapping into something very deep. Of course, we don't know nearly any of the answers to these questions, but those circuits are often impaired in um, mental illnesses, schizophrenia. These circuits may respond differently um, in their um, impaired state. We don't know enough about that. Another aspect of music, of course, is the rhythmicity, as was just mentioned. And uh, rhythms in the brain are generated by populations of neurons firing in synchrony, out of synchrony, and so on. And um, the efficacy of music might be related in part to uh, the ability to entrain such oscillations in the brain activity. And again, in psychoses and mental illnesses, many rhythms are disrupted. And so uh, finding the right point where music could tap into and correct maybe these kinds of uh, impairments in, in brain rhythms might be also an important feature. But there's a lot of research that still needs to be done. Here in the middle. Um, I was really impressed that some people that were basically nonverbal, when they heard a song, they could sing the words to the song. What I was wondering is, did they sometimes insert their own words, singing, to, as a way of communicating uh, new words rather than just the the words of the song? Is that a a, a means of communicating now to, to sing their thoughts or um, it's a very interesting question um, you know it, it's not that we conducted these experiments in this film so we don't know so like all of the details of of what exactly happened and and how they um, how they exposed them to the songs and whether or not they really sort of like came up with with new words. I mean, you could see that that when they were listening to music, when they were singing along, and then when they interviewed them afterwards, clearly they were more verbal, they were more fluent, they were saying things that certainly, they were using words that they were not hearing, so like in these songs, I assume. Um, there, there is, in, in, you know, something similar we see 
in the patients that I showed you in the beginning that have uh, strokes on one side of the brain and they can't speak but they can't sing. So from that experience, I can tell you, we, we reach, we feel like we have really taught them the tricks on how to actually do this when they reach that, that level where they can actually um, communicate in a singing mode. And it actually works much better for them um, when they would do this compared to speaking. That we speak with each other is just by convention. You know, we could be singing to each other too. And if you have ever, you know, been listening to Gregorian chants, you know, that's sort of like how you would, how the monks, you know, communicate with each other. It's a very powerful way, obviously, of doing it. And you know, I wish it would be much more present in society and we would be using it more. It would certainly help um, a lot of people. There are people who have problems with initiating stutterers, um, people who are afraid to speak and so like have a, a blockage to get their words out. Um, but the, the, what, what sort of like really the unique aspects are, why, why music had this power, that's sort of like under, under some um, under some research, um, and it's, it's possible that, that providing some melodic pattern uh, really engages a different set in the brain, and then putting words on that pattern so like is an easier way for us. Um, a very simple explanation is actually, for example, that when we sing compared to when we speak, we have a lower rate of production. So singing is usually done at about maybe one to two syllables per second, while when we speak, we may easily get to about three to four, and some people are really, really fast. Um, so singing just slows you down, um, and just that slowing down actually allows your brain to just like pay much more attention to what you're actually saying, what you're producing. Um, but there may be many more things to this that, that we still try to discover. I also like to point out that singing is a, is a great instrument. It's that's in ourselves that we don't have to buy. Um, and we all are born with this. You know, babies can sing. They don't have to necessarily be trained. Um, and it's actually something that we sort of like lose when we get into the teenage years. Uh, and then hopefully we recover again when we get older. Another question here. Hi, I'm interested in, from a practical standpoint, um, putting this to action right away, is there an ideal length of time for someone to listen to music, let's say per day, or is there um, some sort of law diminishing returns, for instance, if they're in an activity room and they're listening to music eight hours a day, they, they stop receiving the benefit from it? You you put it in practice. I think Stop. this is for you. Yeah. Um, I listen to music all day. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say there is there's probably not. I mean, I'm not speaking from empiric data here, but uh, I would say there is there's probably no time limit to this. You know, it's it's like the same thing as if you would say well, there's a limit to how much you should be speaking per day. You know, it's a limit on how much you should be walking per day. So I think music is just an activity that we want to engage in, obviously, and that there shouldn't necessarily be any, any limit to this. Um, and we should probably do it as, as much as we can do it. Um, I don't necessarily believe in this idea that there may be some overstimulation that could potentially occur. Um, but at this point, I think it's more an issue of actually delivering it and not really an issue of of, you know, should we do it six hours or eight hours a day? So just to get the music to, to the individuals is probably really the, the, the difficult part right now. Next question's here. Um, I found it was really interesting about the, the, the difference with the keyboard player and the violin player as far as the sections of the brain. And I'm curious if you've done studies of 
um, you know, after two months or after ten years, or how, how quickly do these patterns change? Um, have you done studies with that? Because I feel like if you work with somebody as a music therapy, you know, maybe in two months this part of their brain is is altering. Um, that that gives me feedback and hope that okay, if I work for two months with this person, then there's alterations there and changing physically in their brain structures and, and that to me means progress. Yeah, so <clears throat> functional representation in the brain can change relatively quick. So, you know, let's say if I would be doing a finger tapping task and if I do this for uh, minutes, five, 10, 15 minutes, um, I could prove that the representational area in the brain that is related to this will increase. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I have um, more synapses, more connections, uh, more support cells. So I think um, th these, these parts of the microarchitecture of the brain that actually would support that structure changes that will really take a while, and that may be on the order of days for some of the structures. You know, if you would look at, at synapses and the density of synapses, but if you actually would look at something that, that really sort of like changes structure that you can detect on a macroscopic level, um, you would pr be probably talking about months and maybe even years. Um, it has been examined a lot, obviously, in in animals, in, in mice, and in rats. Um, and the time scale there is always different than you would actually have this in humans. Um, but I would say to really change structure, you're probably going to have to do something that is, that is weeks, months, years. Now, the interesting part is, what if you're going to stop playing the piano? Does the brain shrink back? <laughs> um, and that probably happens too. So if you don't use it, you will lose it as well. Um, and that's something that um, you know, we have to be aware of too. I think from the point of view of the basic biology of brain plasticity, I talked about critical periods very briefly and the idea that our brain is particularly malleable early in life and so get those good experiences in early. Um, we're learning a lot about how these windows appear and disappear. And uh, I think one of the bigger uh, surprises in the recent years has been that um, while it might be true that certain plasticity factors disappear with age, there are also factors which emerge with age and that the brain is actively making molecules to prevent too much rewiring. And if that's the case, it totally changes the way we think about these critical periods. It suggests that brain plasticity is actually what the brain would like to be engaged in, but it adds this extra layer of what we call break-like factors to suppress too much rewiring. So uh, some of you who were really paying attention to one of my slides where I was showing the mice becoming less anxious because of early music, there were two other columns of bars there. And in those animals, we were able to reopen plasticity in adulthood by lifting some of these breaks, um, either using a genetic trick or a pharmacological agent. And um, this suggests that there is a certain uh, opportunity or potential for plasticity in all of us. And through natural experience or pharmacology, we might be able to lift these breaks, expose more of this plasticity. And certainly, um, these windows of natural critical periods are staggered in time. And so music is a wonderful stimulus because it's so um, engaging of many parts of the brain, and especially in the human brain, higher order areas which may have longer or even open-ended critical periods because they may not express these break-like factors. And so it's a, it's a wonderful area for um, looking at how uh, brain plasticity might be continued throughout life. We have another question here. Hi, easy question uh, about your methods. I was wondering uh, what software did you use for the DTI <laughs> imaging and what did you use for the, uh, this, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on what it was exactly. The 
functional imaging or structural the, imaging? The prefrontal cortex pictures. Um, so for analysis of diffusion tensor images, we use a software that has been developed in England it's called um, FSL. Um, and for functional image analysis, we use a software that has also been developed in England, mainly in London, which is called SPM, Statistical Parametric Mapping. And then um, for structural analysis, so sort of like looking at brain size differences or um, um, sizes of particular structures in the brain, we have some of that developed ourselves, or we just use whatever we can get our hands on. <laughs> One last question over here. One of the things that I remember from the, the movie was the, uh, some graphics about the population of the world and that there'll be lots of aging people and we will have to take care of them and things like that. I wondered if there was a sense of urgency um, in terms of funding and research and and just like to be prepared and exploring new ways of treatments and stuff. Is there urgency? Well, it's the National Institute of Aging. <laughs> so at least like there is an institute, a federal institute that is supposed to do research on this and, and will give out grants. Um, as you probably know, the, um, the funding of the NIH in general has gone down. Um, and there is so like less money available to research some of this. Um, I think with regard to the healthcare costs, um, as a physician, I would say we really have no idea what's going to happen to us and healthcare in general over the next um, 15 to 30 years, and how much it's, this is really going to cost. Um, to take care of, um, of all of the baby boomers basically reaching retirement age, living longer, um, certainly being more sick than our parents. Um, so I, I think um, there will be so like another form of awakening um, to, to, to so like deal with these problems and to figure out how we can financially deal with this. And at the same time, you know, the, the U.S. may not quite be as affected by this, um, but I know in European countries, well, the country where I was born in Germany, I, the, the pyramid is actually really going to be completely inverse. So I, we know that right now there will be, the, or I think in, in 2030 or 2040, there will be more people alive over 60 than there will be under 60. So there are, will be a tremendous problems that societies are going to face with the aging population and who is going to take care of all the people that are aging and that actually are going to live longer and probably going to need more care. It's uh, definitely a global issue uh, in Japan where I was born. It's the same, one of the longest lived um, populations. About four or five years ago, on the occasion of uh, JFK's moonshot speech, which many of you may know about, where he challenged the country to invest in science and technology to land a man on the moon in 10 years' time, and they did it in 1969. And that uh, speech was very inspirational because it wasn't about getting a man on the moon. Sure, that's great. But it launched Silicon Valley and all of this industry that uh, made it possible to uh, achieve the task, and it really galvanized the nation behind a very concrete mission. Um, Fifty years later, uh, a new kind of consortium was devised by Patrick Kennedy, in particular, um, called One Mind for Research, and there was a gala event with a symposium and um, at the JFK Library, 
And um, every other year, there is a gathering of this one mind for research. And the, the thinking behind this group is that, unfortunately, the federal government and NIH is not moving fast enough. And it might be necessary to unite the private uh, pharmaceutical industries, um, as well as NIH partnership, and interestingly, uh, the Defense Department. And uh, the two main fo foci of interest um, was this aging, rapidly aging population and all of the mental health related issues, as well as um, uh, war veterans and post-traumatic uh, stress related disorders. And um, it's been, it's still early days, only a few years since it started. I think they're trying very hard to uh, generate uh, funds from all sources that are possible, but it's not nearly enough. Um, I think it's hard for people to appreciate in the moment what will happen even 10 years from now. Um, but I think we need to move on this quickly. I, the, the movie makes a very uh, striking point, and I, I hope these sorts of events will raise awareness for sure. Thank you very much for joining us tonight, and thank you so much to Dr. Schlaug and Dr. Hench. Um, I'm so, so sorry we missed the last 10 minutes. Uh, I did just check. It's a bit, the movie's available on iTunes, Amazon, and Netflix. Not any of our sponsors. Um, I'm, I am very happy that we were able to meet uh, Henry, Denise, and old Johnny Boy. Uh, and that we got to see Dr. Schlaug's movies of his patients in therapy, as well as find out from Dr. Hench that some areas of plasticity do emerge with age. Uh, and also, finally, if you are an out-of-tune singer, don't let it stop you. You're in good company. Keep singing. Have a great night, folks. If you'd like to find out about our fall programming, please sign up to be on our brochure. Thanks a lot, and have a great summer. Thanks. Thanks.